Mr. Smirkanish and his wife have raised four wonderful children who have all attended Episcopal. Please stand and join me in welcoming Mr. Michael Smirkanish. Thank you very much, Father Gavin, Dr. Locke, members of the Murphy family. It's a privilege to be here. In 2009, Barack Obama's first year in office, I received a telephone call from a member of his staff wanting to know if I would be interested in coming to the White House and conducting what would be his first live radio interview. Of course, was my answer. I was promised 30 minutes with the president one-on-one. -on -one. I was told that the interview would be carried live on CNN, MSNBC, and Fox, and that there would be no restrictions on any of the questions that I could ask of the president. And so, over the next few days, I was inundated with literally thousands of suggestions from radio listeners who said, you must ask this question of President Obama. Those offering suggestions included our then three sons, one of whom is your classmate. I don't know if it was Simon or one of his older brothers. The boys were then 9, 11, and 13. But one of them said at family dinner the night before I went to Washington, Dad, make sure you ask the president about the Book of Secrets. And I said, okay, but you're going to have to remind me. And the answer was, well, Dad, we just saw Nicolas Cage in National Treasure 2. When the president gets elected, he gets the Resolute Desk and the Book of Secrets. And the Book of Secrets explains, did we really land on the moon? Who killed JFK and what's in Area 51? I said, I can't make any commitment, but I'll see if I can work it in. The next day, I'm at the White House. And I am in the diplomatic reception room. In fact, I'm located precisely where FDR delivered the fireside chats during World War II. There were many members of the media who were already gathered to watch this interview. The president arrived two to three minutes early, meaning before the radio microphones were hot. I didn't want to waste any of my questions on President Obama because then they wouldn't be heard by the radio audience. An Episcopal crowd should know where this is headed. I extended a hand, he extended a hand. I said, what's in the Book of Secrets? And he said, if I told you, I'd have to kill you. <laughs> we chatted and then the interview began. And the interview, as promised, was 30 minutes, one-on-one, -on -one, all substance. No boxers versus briefs questions. We'd not yet killed bin Laden, so I asked about the hunt for bin Laden. The Affordable Care Act had not yet been passed, so we discussed health care. There was then an economic program that was being debated called Cash for Clunkers. We spent a lot of time on that. It was carried live on three cable channels. I didn't think that I embarrassed myself. I went home having created no viral moments. The next day, here was the headline from the Associated Press that ran in 400 newspapers across the country. <laughs> and the sum and substance of that story was only to discuss that one question that I had asked of the president before we were live on radio. And you would have thought, if you read only the story, that this broadcaster from outside of Philadelphia was given a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity, and that's how he chose to use it. There's a lesson in that. Namely, that what gets attention today is often not the serious, but the salacious. Not the cordial, but often the contentious. That's not the way that it's always been. I've been very fortunate. Dr. Locke gave you his version. Here's mine. I became interested in politics at your age when I was a senior in high school at Central Bucks West in Doylestown in 1980 as a newly minted Republican voter. I skipped school with a buddy of mine. We took the train into Reading Terminal just to then go to South Philadelphia because I'd been tipped off that Ronald Reagan was about to do a campaign event in Philadelphia's Italian market. Before the age 
of iPhones, I had in my pocket what your parents had in theirs, which was something called a Kodak Pocket Instamatic camera. While I carried the camera with me on the train, I was too lazy to take the flash attachment. And this was the result. <laughs> we all have blurry messes like that from back in the day. By the way, if you look over Reagan's right shoulder, you can see the word sausage inside the Esposito's meat market. <laughs> Luckily, I got another chance to meet the Gipper just before I headed off to college. This time, I did bring the flash. At Lehigh University, I arrived on campus all full of enthusiasm for politics in general and the Reagan-Bush ticket in particular. I mistakenly thought that my classmates shared my passion for one or the other. Nobody was interested in politics. So I hatched an idea. I knew how I would get the multitude of Reagan-Bush supporters out of their dorm rooms. I would throw a certain type of party. This is the actual flyer from my party. The date, that Wednesday, it was October 17, 1980, which will mean nothing to any of you, but perhaps I'd remind your parents by saying, Phillies, Royals, World Series, Steve Carlton pitching, a 10-inning game, Phillies lose 4-3, and nobody came to the party. <laughs> now, that's not a figure of speech, I don't mean that five people came or 20, no, no, I mean literally nobody came to the party. I was then living in an all-male all -male dorm at Lehigh called Taylor House. 150 guys, no cell phone, no internet. Ask Mr. Durgham about Taylor Hall. He'll regale you with stories, I'm sure. But it was nearly impossible to get a competent phone message. It must have been an act of divine intervention that one day somebody shouted down the hall and they told me that the phone was for me and when I picked up the line they told me at the other end that they were calling from George Bush's office. George Bush was then the Republican vice presidential candidate. I thought because of the party that went bust that I was getting pranked. But indeed, this representative of the future vice president of the United States was calling me to ask whether members of my club would be willing in a pre-9-11 world to drive motorcade cars for a visit that George Bush was about to make to the Bethlehem Steel plant. I hung up the phone, I knocked on the doors of liberals, communists, independents, and I said, who wants to work and meet the next vice president of the United States? Little did I know that after driving the motorcade cars, that was the beginning of my relationship with the future vice president and president by the time that I was 20 years old, I was now flying across the country and twice around the world, planning the logistics of personal appearances for the vice president. I stayed politically active through college. By the time I got to law school at Penn, I myself ran for the state legislature. That is a very happy 24-year-old who has no idea he's about to lose by 419 votes. I have since located 237 of those people. When I was 29, George Bush was now president. He appointed me to a position that Dr. Locke made reference to where I was responsible for all federal housing in five states in Washington, D.C. And it was those unique political experiences at an early age that led to my being invited to provide first radio commentary and then television commentary on the Philadelphia Network affiliates, and I've been doing it ever since. On election night 2016, I spent nine hours on CNN set with Anderson Cooper, 13 million people watched us. That's the largest cable audience ever. That's more than the OJ White Ford Bronco chase. That's more than Princess Diana's funeral. That's more than Michael Jackson's acquittal. I tell you all this for two reasons. First, to let you know that no matter what side of the political aisle most appeals to you, there's great opportunity waiting for you if you get involved early at a young age. Candidates and campaigns, they need volunteers. Republican, Democratic, Independent, it matters not to me. Get involved early. You'll have ownership stake in the future of your country 
And if my experience is any indication, you'll make friends for life. But I have an additional message. I've been intimately involved in our political process for the last 38 years now. I've been witness to significant political change, most of it for the worse. I'm not talking about a particular party or person who may be in power at a particular time. I'm talking about the process. I'm talking about the climate. It's all become so negative, so hyperpartisan. The interpersonal attacks and the predictable party line voting. And it occurs to me as a father of four of my own that because of your age, that's all you know. It's not the way that it's always been, even in the modern era. And it's certainly not the way that it should be. When I was in your position, when I was turning 18 and registering to vote for the first time, Ronald Reagan was about to be elected president of the United States as a Republican. Tip O'Neill was the Democratic Speaker of the House of Representatives. They disagreed on most matters of policy, but they found a way to be civil to one another. They were able to maintain a relationship of civility such that when Reagan was shot early in his term, Tip O'Neill was the only non-family member allowed to Reagan's hospital bedside to pay respects. The two men recited the 23rd Psalm together, as was captured in this painting that was just unveiled at the Union League of Philadelphia where it remains on display. When Tip O'Neill turned 69, he was hosted by Reagan at the White House. And Ronald Reagan proposed to Tip O'Neill an old Irish toast. He said, Tip, if I had a ticket to heaven and you didn't have one too, I'd throw mine away and go to hell with you. <laughs> Is Father Gavin laughing? <laughs> Things have changed dramatically in the last 30 years. Civil discourse is dead. You just saw that. If you were paying close attention to the nomination process for now, Justice Kavanaugh, or if in the last two days you've paid attention to law enforcement going after the individual responsible for these presumed bombs that have, been married, that have been mailed to elected officials all across the country. It's gotten so bad that by some measures, partyism today exceeds racism. In 1960, Americans were asked, how would you feel if your son or your daughter married outside of your political party? Not race, not religion, but political party. In 1960, only 5% of Republicans said that would matter to them. 4% of Democrats said they'd be displeased. So 50 years later, researchers at Stanford asked the same question. Now they found that 49% of Republicans, 33% of Democrats said they'd be displeased. And when a UCLA political science professor by the name of Lynn Vavrick in 2016, at the time of the election, wanted to ask the same question, she got an even worse result. At the same time, acceptance of interracial marriage in the United States grew to 85%. So more parents today would rather their sons and daughters marry outside their race than marry outside their political party. Partyism has become a new form of discrimination. That's what I was trying to convey with the title of my new book, Clowns to the Left of Me, Jokers to the Right, American Life in Columns. You can see that not even my publicist knew how to market a centrist, so they turned me sideways. We've been heading in this direction for decades. There are many causes. They include geography. You know what gerrymandering is. That's a big part of the problem. Money plays a role, dark money, the idea that money gets spent on campaigns and we have no idea when we see the commercials who wrote the check for that particular candidate. The media is certainly one of the causes of the partisanship and the divide that now exists in the country. But there's another factor that I know you are intimately familiar with, and that's technology. Don't misunderstand what I'm saying. I, too, love technology. I have a website. 
I'm active on Facebook. I use Instagram. My son, your classmate, thinks I'm in the Stone Age, but sometimes I know what I'm doing. Technology allows me to juggle responsibilities I would otherwise not be able to undertake because I don't have a staff. All of my show research today is done via the internet. I can remember when I started in radio, I used to have hard copies of two or three newspapers in studio with me at all times. I like taking pictures with my iPhone. I like being transported by Uber. I like being directed by Waze. I like making reservations on open table. But while technology has made all of our lives much easier, I'm convinced it has hampered our political process in two distinct ways. First, it has enabled us to segregate ourselves in a way that's not healthy. Our computers allow us now to easily associate with the like-minded. Technology has sped a process that began in the United States in the 1960s that author Bill Bishop calls the big sort. And this phenomena is not an entirely political phenomena, but what he says is this. As a society in the 60s, we began to disengage from one another. Less membership in social organizations, less participation in the local bowling league, less support for our local newspapers. And when we re-engaged as a society, now in the computer era, we were able to do so in a way that it was easy to seek out the like-minded. In other words, it became easier to find people with a similar political perspective. We don't associate anymore with those who don't see the world the way that we do. And the irony is that we've never had as much choice as we have today. AM radio, FM radio, satellite radio, conventional television, cable television, the internet. And yet so few people seem to take advantage of all of that choice that's made available to them. Instead, we hunker down in these alternative media silos. Many Facebook pages become echo chambers for the like-minded. The more political you are, it seems the more that you listen to only one side. I argue that you're not really read in unless you're sampling all perspectives and all points of view. But I have an even larger concern about the role of technology and how it relates to politics. I pay attention when people engage me about my work, my opinions, whether it's on radio or television, or if it's something that I've written. If I'm, if I'm walking down Walnut Street in Center City, Philadelphia, if I'm pumping gas in Gladwin or coming to a back to school night, as I've done so many times at Episcopal, people will seek me out and share with me their political point of view. Never have those encounters been uncivil. People disagree with me constantly, but never an uncivil word has been spoken to me face to face. Wow. You should compare that to the way people engage with me via Twitter, Facebook, or the comments that they post appended to my newspaper columns. They say things with a keyboard they would never say to your face. And that negativity, I think is half, that's the tame stuff. It's Episcopal Academy. I could show you worse. That negativity is having an impact on our discourse. It, it normalizes the name calling and the partisanship and it prevents opposing sides from working together to solve big problems. It also creates a false impression. It creates the false impression that as a country we're inexorably divided. And with today's headlines, it's easy to forget our commonalities, but they're there. I know that because for the last 20 years, my real job has been answering the telephone from people who call me all across the country on whatever subject of front page news they choose to engage. Those thousands of interactions tell me that there's far more that actually unites us than divides us. 
And my anecdotal observations have been borne out time and again in the political science. In 2017, Morris Fiorina at Stanford, their Hoover Institution, published a book, Unstable Majorities, Polarization, Party Sorting, and Political Stalemate. He found that the nation today is actually no more politically divided than we were in the 1970s. The parties and the politicians, they are much more doctrinaire and they've sorted themselves into these narrow groups at the far ends of the political spectrum. But the typical Democratic, the typical Republican voter, their viewpoints have not shifted in the last 30 or 40 years. Sadly, what many have done is start to think in personal terms about the other side. But it's not issue driven. And my argument is that technology is playing a big role through anonymity in fueling this. At our core, I'm convinced we're interested in and striving for the same things for ourselves and our families. You know, what do we want? We want good health. We want long lives and the ability to prosper, success for our kids, a few laughs along the way, the ability to worship or not worship. And we want good things for our country. And when I say we want good things for our country, I'm thinking of Democrats and Republicans and independents and those who are non-affiliated. So don't get turned off by the nastiness. Get involved, change it. And when you do get involved, don't contribute in the way in which you use smartphones and laptops. Think before you touch that send key. How would I feel if they could see my face? And if the answer is I'd feel uncomfortable, then don't pull the trigger. I want to leave you with one more story. Dr. Locke mentioned that all four of ours have been privileged to attend the Episcopal Academy. It's funny, the headlines, although I talk about them so often, the headlines don't seem to provide the best fodder, the best material, whether it's radio, television, or newsprint. Instead, it has often come from talking about our four kids. Simon has two brothers and an older sister. She was married last summer. Time flies. But I remember well when she was eight and she went off to summer camp for the very first time. That's Caitlin in her EA jumper. Camp in North Carolina was supposed to last two weeks. We had a very tearful scene when it came time for us to leave her there and I remember going home, and because she didn't have phone privileges, we knew that we had to wait on the mail. No internet. Sunday came, there was no word. Of course, there wouldn't be. Monday, there was no word. Tuesday, there was no word. Wednesday, my wife was getting very nervous. Thursday, no word. Friday, a manila envelope arrived. And in the manila envelope was a stack of letters. She'd been writing to us every day, multiple times, every day. So I assembled the letters in chronological order and tried to piece together, how are things going at camp for this eight-year-old daughter of ours? The letters were funny. The letters were heartbreaking. Here's letter number one. Camp is fun. At one, we have lunch. We had today pizza with cheddar cheese, pepperoni mushrooms, and anchovies. There must have been some talk at the lunch table about swimming because it ends with, I'm off to do a test swimming and there are snakes in there. <laughs> By letter number two, there had been a change. Come and get me now, all caps. <laughs> I'm having no fun. Now I realized I sometimes take you for granite, G-R-A-N-I-T-E, I'm sorry. I'm having no fun, I miss you too much. Renee, my counselor, took me to see Miss K, the nurse, now she thinks I'm a freak, and I was literally going to die, D-Y-E, because when I was crying, I did not get enough air. The pool has snakes, jellyfish, and frogs. <laughs> Letter number three to her mother. 
Every day I think of you and cry. <laughs> like today, it was raining, and you always take me to the movies on rainy days. I cried so much, I wouldn't eat breakfast. Get me ASAP or sooner, and then it's signed SWAT. We didn't know what it meant. Sealed with a tear. <laughs> Letter number four. I hate it, and I'm sick of the word y'all. Here's your assignment, get me home or else. Yesterday there was a talent show. I was an Oompa Loompa in Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. Get me out of here right now. I'm never going to sleep over camp again. Here is my mood. So far today I cried 28 times. Get me out of here. So I need material. I have to fill three hours a day on radio. So I gathered up the letters and I went into my studio. I was then doing afternoon drive in Philadelphia only. And I read those letters aloud. And there was an enormous gender divide in the audience. The guys called and they all said the same thing. They said, you know, I went to camp or I was a counselor at camp and there was always a kid like yours. And you better, you better make her tough it out or she'll be scarred for life. And then women called and they all said the same thing. Two things actually. They said, number one, how dare you invade her privacy? <laughs> and number two, they'd say, you better go get her or she'll be scarred for life. By the time that I was reading those letters, my wife was already pulling a rescue mission in North Carolina. She brought her home, she went back the next summer, and every turn, everything turned out just fine. I bring it up because it was really good radio. <laughs> and you know who told me? Republicans, Democrats, independents, and non-affiliated. And I think there's a real lesson in that. Thank you very much. So, Mr. Smirkanish, thank you very much. We appreciate that. Um, I, I've been given one firm instruction. Uh -oh. It is this. Dad, we better adjourn early. And I intend to honor that. I'm kidding. Go ahead. Not really. <laughs> so, are there any questions from anybody in the audience, students or teachers or guests? Way in the back. Molly. So the question is, what about a three-party system? I'd be thrilled if there were a three-party system. The most recent Gallup survey from September said that 44% of Americans don't regard themselves as Republican or Democrat, but independent. Now, I'm sure many of them are lying. I think there's probably a panache to being independent instead of one of the major parties. But even if you cut that number in half, there are a significant number of individuals yearning for leadership, I think. And the question is, who could pull it off? You know, who could do it? And sadly, because of the problem of money in our system, someone needs to be well-funded in order to do that. I can think of someone who has the ability on both fronts, single-handedly, to make this a third-party country, but he has just decided he's going to run as a Democratic candidate instead of a uh, Republican or Independent. I'm thinking of Michael Bloomberg. So I think that there's this untapped energy out there, but it is an old political expression, you can't beat somebody with nobody. Someone needs to come forth and seize that opportunity. But I'm convinced it would happen. Final thing I'll say on that. There was a survey released last week from uh, a company that, it's, a, uh, it's called Hidden Tribes, and it's a not-for-profit that funded an 8,000-person survey. That's enormous. And they found something, again, which supports what I believe anecdotally, that 14% of this country are calling the shots. 8% on the hard left, 6% on the hard right. I may have those numbers mixed up, but you get the point. And that somewhere between the polar extremes are a whole heck of a lot of other people who tend not to see the world in such doctrinaire, liberal or conservative terms. And they're exhausted. But the 14% on the fringes are the ones who write the check, put up the yard sign, 
work for the candidate, and most reliably come out to vote. And so my argument is that it's time for the nation to stop ceding the debate to the loudest voices among us. Go ahead. I'm for term limits. The problem with term limits is that to bring them about, the very people who'd be impacted by them need to vote for them. So I'm not optimistic that it happens at any point. Now, you know, there's a flip side of that. Uh, when I discuss this on radio, people will say, well, we have term limits. We have term limits every two years for the House of Representatives and every six for the Senate and every four for the president. And if you want to get rid of somebody, all you need to do is go out and cast a ballot. I think it would be a healthier system if we had turnover and if individuals who were in the House or the Senate needed to go back to wherever they came from and earn a living. Topher? So, yes, is my short answer. Um, I, I know that age, that's Dr. Rowe? I, I, age is a relative thing. You know, age is a relative thing. I, I, I lost my dad 10 days ago at age 88. We have members of the Supreme Court who are right there at that age. My dad wasn't in a position where physically or mentally at the latter stages, he, you know, he, he would have been equipped to think through these issues. So I, I get it, you know, 88 to one person is not 88 to, to another person. But I think as a general rule, really there should be a finite period of time that you're there. When I say this statement, I'm trying to uh, protect the integrity of where I am and, and, uh, and keep it down the middle. Um, I don't want this to be a reflection only on Justice Kavanaugh, but the idea that we just confirm someone who for 40 years, you know, I hope to be here in 40 years, I don't know, that's pretty optimistic, okay, 30 years, but the idea that, that one individual from either party or other stripe is going to have such impact on our lives for all that time leaves me unsettled. Again. Same as the term limit question. It would take such monumental change to alter that that I'm not optimistic that it happens in my lifetime. Scotty. So, great question. How do you get involved besides registering to vote? I, I tell you those stories not to put up my old snap pictures, but to, to try and prove that there's such opportunity out there. I, I don't need to know what your politics are. I would simply say, if there's someone with whom you identify, go work for them. They always need people. And, and young people, my experience has always been, for, for me, when I was young, when I was 18, I was very active in the Republican Party. And the Democratic Party seemed to have control over all young, interested types. So I was the youngest person always in the room. They thought it was such a novelty that they would give me great responsibilities. So I would say identify some, follow a race. Could be a state legislative race, it could be a congressional race, could be a U.S. Senate race. And get active, make yourself known at that headquarters, give a couple of hours. When you go off to school, do it on a, on a college campus. I have friends today that I met through those political circles back in the early 80s who've turned out to be friends for life. They've also turned out to be a social circle and a professional circle. And I think the same thing will happen to those of you who choose to get involved. Time for one more question. Go ahead, Kat. So how can you stay educated, politically speaking, I think is the question. I'm, I'm going to give the, the three-minute version of, of that, if, I, if I'm able, and then, I, and then I'll stop. When I was first involved in politics, uh, and I'm going back now to the, to the 80s and then through the early 90s. In fact, it's funny because there, there's someone here with a very strong EA connection who is the reason that I was given an opportunity to get on the airwaves. I was politically active and had uh, a desire to be on radio or to be on television talking politics. And Brian Tierney, who was here, was himself guest hosting a Philadelphia talk radio program and brought me on as his guest. 
So I was a guest of the guest host. And the ego of it consumed me. I, I thought I had a skill set for it, but I, I so enjoyed uh, that opportunity and that experience. The talk radio world at that time was very mixed. We had not yet gone in this polarized direction. You know, the media world consisted no internet, right? No cell phone, no cable, no satellite radio. The media world consisted of the big three networks and big newspapers. And ideologically speaking, they really did skew to the left. And there was a big personality in Sacramento who was then syndicated as, a, as an AM talk radio host named Rush Limbaugh. And Limbaugh had great success because conservatives had not really been welcomed anywhere. And so radio stations across the country now wanted Rush, and they wanted a stable of his imitators. And overnight, the nature of AM talk radio changed. The Philadelphia station that Brian hosted me on was a station where you had a liberal, where you had a, a, a conservative, where you had an independent. We had a libertarian, Irv Homer. It was a very mixed bag. It was conversational. But AM talk radio took off. And then Fox News came online in 1996, and they took a page out of that handbook. And then MSNBC came online. And they couldn't find their sea legs initially until they became the liberal version of that. There was a progression of events through which the media became very polarized. And so today, what I argue is that the media is whatever you want it to be. There was a time when you could say that the mainstream media is very left of center. Today, it's whatever you want. It's out there. If I leave you with one idea, it's this. Don't get trapped into one of these silos where you're listening only to Drudge and Breitbart and Fox and AM talk radio or MSNBC and Slate and Salon. Mix it up. You know, change the channel. I try not to go to bed at night without making, I, making sure that I know what everybody is saying on the competing networks because somewhere in all of that lies the truth. But it's up to you to figure out what it is. Thank you very, very much. It's a privilege to be here. Thank you for having me.